Hello and welcome to your award-winning The Reasons I'm Broke podcast, bringing you the reasons we're broke every single week through news and headlines ranging from comics, movies, TV, video games, and more. I'm Daniel, and your co-host this week, straight out of the Ronin console, it is Millennial Mike. Welcome back, Millennial Mike. Straight out of. Like, I, I, like, I literally just, I just came out of it. I, I, I'm not even like... You I were, was running council one day, and like right, I'm right, I'm right here the next day, like fresh, wet yeah, behind the ears still. That's your natural <laughs> state is just in that in the Ronin console, and then yeah. when you're summoned, then you have to leave and come here, and then you go back to your home yeah. natural state. That's all you do, like a, like a genie. Yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's right. Like and, three thousand years of longing, but it's Ronin council. And while you're in there, you're watching a ton of anime, getting ready for the next episode with you and Scott doing <laughs> the next season, covering the next season of anime, and that's just the way things work. You know. Every now and again, you'll tweet. We're just chilling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if this is your very first episode, the way we format the show is we go through this week's news. Then we end it with the broke kept block, which is what Millennial Mike and I have been up to, what's been making us broke, what we've been watching, reading since you last heard us. So let's jump right in and explore sector number 529. <laughs> So some price hikes coming, and this is something that I kind of expected earlier than it did happen, but we are at that point now. Starting this fall, a number of major game launches will be priced at $70. So these include titles like Gotham Knights, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, Dead Island 2, and more. Millennial Mike, I think you do a little bit more gaming than I do these days. Are you ready for this standard in pricing? Yes, because most of the games that I play are free-to-play competitive games. <laughs> oh, you're all set then. <laughs> but you know what? I, I do have things to say about it. I mean, the first thing that you may think is, like, oh, this will not stand. This can't happen. This is going to turn around. You know, they're going to they're gonna go broke because they, they did this. And it's like, well, I don't know. I think they probably made this decision with a lot of data, with a lot of insight. And... I give them the credit for that. I think that the people who play these games will play it because there really aren't any alternatives. I think that ultimately there will be some people who won't or who will wait for the price to go down. So we might see like small opening launches, but then some of those people kind of spread out further. So I I don't know. It's uh, I think that it won't affect things massively, but I do think that in general, people will be forced to make decisions on, Hey, like, you know, is the quality of this game. It's, they're going to have to continue to put the quality out there if they want people to spend more money. Now, like games like Gotham, I, I don't know, because like that game looked like crap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I wouldn't pay 60 bucks for that. But this podcast may be old enough to where we may have touched on this years ago when $60 started to become the standard and some games were still sitting at 50. Nintendo was more famous for that with the Wii, where they were like, we're keeping our AAA titles at $50. They wasted no time. They went straight to 70. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, we're not doing that this time. And my argument remains the same. I don't know if you remember, but N64 games back in the day were, you can find old ads from Toys R Us, from Target, and Sears, back when they sold a ton of video games, of N64 titles being $79.99. And this is pre-inflation. That's that's Mm -hmm. what, $100 a game if you were to adjust for it? Yeah. So to me, it, it, always, it always seemed like games weren't keeping up with inflation and we were always kind of getting a deal at $60, even especially $50. Perhaps. I would say maybe at that time, N64 was still pretty deep into the rise of gaming as far as like its popularity. I mean, obviously the GameCube was Nintendo's peak. So I, I was I mean, maybe that like, because of the they were going to expect the volume of people buying it to make up for the the cost right so oh it's a higher price there are less people buying it so we can get away with that now they're as popular has risen like you know with the gamecube for instance and, and further consoles and we know that the, the the player base is there we can price the game lower i know we're going to make back the difference but I don't think N64 was so far removed, so different from further generations that that would really be true. So I, I, I really can't make like a justification for that. But I don't know. I think ultimately 
the market will figure it out, probably. <laughs> That's exactly what's going to happen. I think consumers will, over the couple of years, decide whether $70 is the new standard. They're okay with it. They're comfortable with that pricing. I, I also kind of want to touch on the fact that there's probably, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's probably less physical titles being printed now than there were back when the $60 standard was set eight which years is, ago or so. Which, which is another reason why this is bad. <laughs> well, it's could, like, that, could that drive the prices up then because there's less of them being printed? Everyone's going digital now. Everyone's going over to Game Pass where they know they're going to get this $70 game. For for example, the amazing Microsoft Game Pass, it's probably the best deal in gaming right now, and it is available for both PC and Xbox. You sign up for that, and then you get AAA titles that are going to be $70, like the next Call of Duty as soon as this deal goes through between Microsoft and Activision. And you can say, well, I could spend $70 and get the new Call of Duty, or I can get Game Pass, get Call of Duty, and a library of titles. That might also be one of the reasons why they're like, okay, it's driving these prices up. Got it. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to de-incentivize people making both physical purchases as well as owning the game even digitally. They want people to go completely to a streaming model to where they're just paying to stream the games temporarily while they have a streaming service. I think that is a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm never going to be for that. Totally. I mean, I think it's great that the option is there. I think that in general, the quality of games have gone down. So I think that you're going to, people are still going to have issues and gamers are going to suffer ultimately just because of the, the lack of polish and the diminishing returns that people are getting as far as the the quality of games. You know, like the AIs haven't gotten any smarter. Like let's forget graphics. Like just AI, for instance, I don't think it's gotten much smarter. I don't think they've made a lot of advances in that. And so like if you're trying to play like a game that's single player and you want to play it like competitively or dynamically with an AI, you're gonna have a still a pretty crappy experience and you're gonna be able to cheese it pretty easily if you know what to do. So things like that haven't really improved, and yet they're driving the the price up. I feel that that's not going to last for very long unless they start to justify it somehow. And I do think there are some other factors, such as the fact that gaming is so big now compared to how it was back in the N64 days, which means there's bigger studios involved. We know there's bigger companies involved, like Google and Amazon trying to get into this gaming space. So it has the attention. They know there's money there, which is probably rising the cost of people who work on these games. These studios are getting higher budgets, which means they are demanding more money. That money has to come from somewhere aside from an investment from these people like Microsoft or Google or Sony. Did you hear about the Stadia news? Because you just brought up Google and I I did a quick search of the show notes. I didn't notice Stadia, which is something that we, we could talk about. Yeah, yeah, bit. let's Actually, touch on it because they're, they're now no longer involved in the gaming space as far as Stadia, right? Yeah, basically what I heard is that they were shutting down the servers or something to that effect, which is not surprising. I mean, Google software is all just, just a big psyop, you know? <laughs> it's just a big like test a big like uh social you know a social test or whatever because it's like they don't ever keep anything around they don't ever support anything long term you can never expect it they always come out with interesting ideas and they're always the first ones to do it but they never follow through and that's just google so i'm really not surprised at all although i am disappointed i had heard a couple of things about stadia but I don't think our circle of friends, anyone owned one that I know of, or if they did, they didn't even talk about it. So I honestly thought this was Stadia was more like a, and I get now that it's like a streaming type of system, but I thought it was like a, another, yet another VR headset. You know, it just sounded like another thing. And, I, and mm. the fact that I didn't know about it, I, even though I'm not involved in as in gaming as much as everyone else, still kind of says a lot about that that system. Just like everything else, uh, Amazon has what it like Luna, I think it's called. And then, of course, you have Xbox Game Pass and NVIDIA has one called GeForce, which I, I've used before and works quite well. They've had it for a while. They're, they were one of the early adopters in the streaming game kind of services. It, it can definitely work. Obviously, you have to have the equipment. A lot of the issue comes issues come from infrastructure, how many people and how many places have the proper equipment to make it legitimate and justifiable and and viable, uh, I should say. And I think that, 
in general, it's not where we want it to be, but it's getting there. And I definitely think that people should be leading the way. So that way people are used to the idea by the time we get there. I mean, obviously it's going to be something that has to happen over time, but Google is just a disappointment. Like they don't have, there's no excuse <laughs> for them. They're just, they're just scrappy. Well, let us know on Twitter if you are ready for the $70 price tag, if you will miss Stadia, or if you're just a PC Game Pass guy that's like, that doesn't affect me any. I'm just going to keep doing my thing. I've got plenty of games to play to catch up on. I know Scott has a library of games he's catching up on. So let us know online. GameStop is struggling, according to employees, to fulfill pre-orders for various new games, including major titles like NBA 2K23. First reported by Kotaku, the GameStop employees are noting that various system issues are leading to stores not having enough copies to give people that already paid for the game. So let's make that clear. It doesn't mean that GameStop, nor in this, in this report does it say GameStop couldn't afford to fulfill its shipment of orders, and so they cut their orders down. It just says that there are system issues that have messed with their numbers as far as these games. Right now, GameStop employees are noted that the current solution is to just order them a copy of the game to send to the customer's house straight from the warehouse, but it's likely not intended to be a permanent solution just for now on these games. But that's a pretty big hit because from my years at GameStop, I know people are not willing to wait for that game to arrive, even if you overnight it. They will say, hey, just cancel my pre-order and I'll just head on over to Target and pick up the game now. They will not wait because all their friends are talking about it. They're all playing, especially if it's something massive multiplayer like Call of Duty or Halo. So this looks like a pretty big setback for at least the these current string of games that GameStop is trying to juggle with. Yeah. Yeah, I I don't feel I don't have good feelings about it. I mean, if I'm being charitable, this is helping along the transition to streaming only platforms, basically the supply chain issues, which are there's probably some legitimate legitimacy to it. And because of that legitimacy, you never know when these companies are playing into it and when they're not and when they could be doing more and when they've conveniently choosing not to do more. In the end, it just sounds like there are too many people with incentives to and then too many actual reasons for just physical games not to work, you know, so it's it's really not surprising again. And the supply chain issues with the current state of international and foreign aren't going to get any better. So it's just going to get worse and worse until we are all in the metaverse playing games on our virtual, you know, brain pass consoles or whatever our <laughs> neural links <laughs> there you go that's that's it copyright it now <laughs> i think you're right an industry like gamestop even if you go into places like best buy target you will see that their gaming sections and movie section physical media section is shrinking and that's something scott and i noticed last year at target especially best buy you've been seeing that for several years on their yeah. movies and and music so these places are no longer target platforms for these companies anymore. Ten years ago, sure, you had to cater to places like GameStop and say, okay, let's how many copies do we need to ship you? GameStop would in turn push pre-orders like crazy so that that would drive the numbers up of the numbered ordered copies. So they can say they can turn to these companies and say, look how many copies of this game we ordered. Let's work on a higher discount for the next shipment or give us some exclusives to incentivize customers to come straight to GameStop as opposed to shopping online or to some of these other locations in person. But with things like we were mentioning streaming services, at least for games or even online retailers, digital sales, these aren't big players in the games anymore. These companies don't have to worry about this middleman to sell that gamer that the experience or to have them even start playing. Right now, they're, I think, and I could be wrong, but I think their goal is just how do we get gamers to play our game as opposed to how do we get them to come out and buy the game? Now it's they just go directly to the consumer. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's definitely true. It, 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 it now, like everything else, is a question of content and content is tracked and analyzed by engagement so because now it doesn't even matter necessarily how many units are sold because it's about how long they keep their subscription and 
what kinds of content they're engaging with and how long and other kinds of data points and things like that. I think that video games are basically indistinguishable between movies. I mean, this has been a slow progress. Video games are, are becoming more and more narrative and cinematic in their presentation. And the experiences are presented a lot like a, a you know a film or a movie. Now the distribution is also a lot like a film or a movie. So at this point, you can basically just, you know, at, at this point, you know, services like Netflix are getting into gaming. They have their own gaming studio. They have purchased some studios. They're trying to put their own thing together. And I imagine that's probably going to come down the pike for other streaming services to, to the point where we're not going to have game publishers anymore. I'm sure because, like, you know, Xbox and Microsoft, they, they've been trying to for a while get into, you know, they want their, their product to be a lifestyle product and they want their their platform to be a entertainment platform as opposed to a gaming platform. That was the big issue, quote unquote, issue that they had with the uh, original Xbox One, which in my opinion, they were just a little bit too early to the game mm. in that situation. Uh, it wasn't that there was an issue. It just, they, should, they shouldn't have pushed so hard and sold it like that. So at this point, everything's blended together. It's all just content. And pretty pretty soon, you know, Microsoft, Netflix, whatever, they're going to be like, okay, this person is engaging with this much action content, whether it's games or movies, it doesn't even matter, you know, or this much, this content, like all these data points could be completely traversed. So I'm not sure what the ramifications for that will be. I mean, is it all negative? No, but in general, I'm I'm kind of skeptical. A lot of changes to the industry <laughs> and some stuff that COVID especially has accelerated, as as people have often said. So it's very interesting to see how, where we're at post-COVID because who knows if this would have been the state of things without that. I'm not too sure if we would have been quite as far along on this thing, but... It was all planned. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's, a, it's one of those things, GameStop, I used to work at, and I have some good memories and some bad memories of the company itself. I love the people I worked with, not so much what the company kind of put its employees through week to week, literally numbers wise. So I'm personally not going to be too broken up if there is no GameStop anymore. And I get that there's a collector's market out there. It's terrible for the physical collector who wants to go to a place and buy games. I totally understand that used games, especially that would drive up the price of used games is what's been speculated if GameStop goes under because it's one less avenue for those titles. But I personally am not too shaken up about it because I'm just simply not as involved in the collecting market when it comes to games either. You, you know what I think is kind of messed up? I think that the fact that everything is going digital now, the fact that you actually bother going out of your way to buy a physical product automatically makes you a collector. It's like, <laughs> oh, I just own things. It's like pretty soon we're not going to own anything. And anyone yep. who chooses to, to try or attempt to own something is a collector. Like I want to literally make a dystopian novel about people called the collectors. And there's people who believe in autonomy. <laughs> It's not a bad idea because that's that's where we're going. <laughs> Honestly, you're right. <laughs> like when we lost power during this hurricane season or even internet, whenever we lose internet and if there's a bad storm, I'm happy I have my physical product because if I had to stream all my content constantly, fuck that, man. I'd be out of luck. <laughs> but I'm like, oh shit, I got Blu-rays. As long as I have power, I've got Blu-rays, I've got DVDs, I've got physical discs of games and pop in a movie. Happened with Leo the last week. There was no internet, or at least it went out for a bit, and Leo wanted to watch Cars, I think, and so we got it. We got the Blu-ray. Boom, pop it in, start watching your movie, problem solved. I don't even know if that's going to be possible in 50 years, to be honest with you, and that's kind of the sad and scary thing, but I might be a dinosaur in this. Yeah, I mean, we all will be one day, so I'll, I'll meet you on the other side, my friend. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> See you there. <laughs> <laughs> and this week we do have some MCU news, and that's always a good thing, obviously. All right, everyone knows by now, if I cover MCU, it's usually a bad thing. According to a reporter at LA Mag, Oscar winner and lead actor Mahershala Ali is, quote, very frustrated, end quote, with the filmmaking process of Disney's MCU Blade. Jeff Snyder, who is this reporter at LA Mag, said, quote, I'm told that the current Blade script is roughly 90 pages and features exactly two lackluster action sequences. Mahershala said to be very frustrated with the process. Feige said to be spread too thin. End quote. 
So some of the rumored changes are that the original director, who's no longer attached, they're looking for a director, even though pre-production's about to start. Not a big surprise there, but the original director wanted this to be an R-rated film, but mandates from Disney have removed any blood from the film to keep it at PG-13. Blade will supposedly also be fighting supernatural monsters rather than other vampires to avoid a higher movie rating. As I mentioned, principal photography is set to begin next month. Still no director scheduled for release next year on November 3rd. I think this is pretty standard for MCU news that we've seen this with Ant-Man. We saw this with Doctor Strange 2, and now we're seeing it with Blade directors just leaving left and right. I'm trying to think about think about things that maybe we're, we haven't thought about or we haven't brought up or or considered. And lately, I've been a little bit disillusioned. Well, <laughs> not just lately, but I, I've been a little bit disillusioned and kind of just baffled by the idea of ratings because ratings were always kind of like a way to allow parents to decide what their kids could watch. But even more specifically, it, it, it came in, it came into play, especially in the movie going era where we would go to theaters where the theaters would actually, they would kind of like, you know, they would make the executive decision. They, they'd make the determination. Like, Hey, you're too young. You can't, and you know, we're long past that point. Mm-hmm. You know, there was, there was a point where they stopped caring. And then there was a point where streaming became a thing. And, Parents stop caring, and now kids have access to it, and parents have access to it, and it doesn't really even matter. Like ratings don't actually matter anymore. Now, I guess to some people and some demographics with certain values, maybe it does, but I think at large, it, it matters a lot less than it used to. And that's saying something, considering that ratings are like a PG thirteen movie now would be R rated, you know, a few decades ago. Mm-hmm. So, like, let's say this whole, like, I wonder if this is what Disney's thinking. Like, oh, we're trying to get this to PG-13. I wonder if they're trying to get to PG-13 or if they're trying to get the content to actually change. Because I've noticed that Disney makes changes to their content. They censor things that aren't actually necessary. They have nothing to do with, you know, content or explicitness or, or whatever. Things that wouldn't necessarily get you to change rating. Like, things that you could actually get away with in a PG-13 movie, they just choose not to do it. Like that one body in Winter Soldier, right? Where the eyes were opened or something and there was blood behind. I don't remember what it was, but they made yeah. that change and that wouldn't have changed the rating. Right. And and they do these, these kinds of things all the time where they make changes and they censor things, even though it wouldn't actually change the rating. So what does that even mean? Like, why, why would you even do that? That's something that I, I can't quite wrap my, I mean, I have theories and whatever, but. Well, with this movie on Blade, obviously the director would be frustrated because he's not going to, they're not going to make the movie that they want to make. And that's the deal. I mean, when you get into bed with Disney, you are a yes man, honestly. Let's, let's be real with it right now. You, you can't, you, they probably couldn't make Iron Man one the way that they made it. And I think that was a paramount picture, right? It was a partnership. It was, yeah. So, I mean, even Disney didn't make that one, but let's pretend they would not be able to make that movie today. I think it'd be very different. You wouldn't have them mowing down terrorists <laughs> like in yeah. the, that opening scene or whatever. Even even the themes of war uh, yes. would be, even though they might technically still be there, the way that they portrayed Tony as a relatable and conflicted person would be a lot different. There'd be a lot more finger wagging probably. <laughs> Absolutely. And and w- right now, that's what they're doing with Blade. They they supposedly don't want blood in a Blade movie, which is a, probably an immediate R rating, under that impression that either, like you were saying, they're just making content changes based on their agenda, or they're still under that ancient mindset of higher ratings means lower box office. And even though we've had big hits like Joker, where R-rated movies can hit over a billion dollars, Deadpool did extremely well, both of them. The R-rated movies, Logan, same thing. But they're still so maybe they're still under that mindset that a lower rating means a higher box office, and it's not too far along or long ago that we saw Warner Brothers making same the same changes over that supposed mindset that it needs to be PG thirteen, it needs to be on there two hours long. It's all about the box office. And honestly, if I were a Blade fan, I mean, I'd be very disappointed at these changes. I probably would not be looking forward to the MCU's Blade. But I think that the general audience at large are going to be okay with whatever they put out. And I think they will come out for this Blade film. 
I don't know why. I don't know why. I I think it's quite interesting how accepting most people are of getting watered down censored content. It's it is strange, you know, because I think maybe it has to do with the demographic. I mean, the problem I the the issue I always face is like, okay, if most of these are adults, if the adults have kids and the adults are of the opinion that certain kinds of content is bad for their kids and or the very trusting of the MPAA system, they might go along with this, right? So if that's the major the major demographic for Blade, then I guess that's the reason why they're making this change, right? But or or just MCU movies in general. But if the major demographic are, you know, fully grown 18 years or older adults with their own expendable income, why would they ever opt for something that's more watered down you know I, I, it doesn't make any sense i mean it's you know I, I i don't know what that what that's all about so and i think that most people don't really care about artistic integrity so no. from that standpoint th- there's no one who cares about that yeah no and and before we move on from blade since we i, I did just bring up deadpool are you on the same boat with me that even though they're promising deadpool is going to be just like the last two movies deadpool 3 is do you it's think a lie. that it's it is it isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a bald faced lie. As a matter of fact, uh, let me give um, someone a shout out here. It's uh, it's her name's Mary. Yeah, I can't find her. She's like, it's like she she has like a, a Batgirl logo right now, but she posts like different comic book related stuff. And she actually recently posted something on Twitter that basically said that oh uh, here Mary loves comics at comic lover Mary with an I on Twitter. She's really cool. But she posted this snippet from like probably Variety or Heroic Hollywood or something like that. And the the title says, Moon Knight marks a brutal shift in MCU's tone, says Kevin Feige. And she's like, that was a freaking lie. (laughs) (laughs) And it's like, it's true. And it's so funny because people defended it on that merit. And I was like, no, this is absolutely not going to be the case. And people were breaking down every little Pope, like screenshot and they're like zooming it oh my god this guy's there's blood on the, on the street you see like that's how desperate mcu fans mm-hmm. are to like play in the grown-ups pool they want to <laughs> they want to be they want to be recognized as like oh this is like serious mature adult films just like anything else but they don't want to just commit to the bit so well for a lot of them moon knight is an edgy rough around the edges project because this is all well, they watch yeah yeah yeah, it, it doesn't change, and it'll be the same thing. Like, and, and you'll you'll hear from a lot of MCU diehards, like, "Oh, you know, like this is them, like you know, they're they're moving in that direction." But that hasn't that ha- hasn't that been how it's always been with everything in the MCU? You watch one thing, and it's always like, "Oh, they're moving in X mm-hmm. direction or Y direction." It's always about what could happen next. So we have like twenty five plus movies or whatever, and we're still talking about what. The, the, the direction that they're moving like why can't we ever just have something here and now <laughs> it's always what's going to happen later and they've been doing it too recently over the netflix projects the marvel shows and how now it's rumored that the daredevil reboot or relaunch that they're coming out with is going to be a toned down version of that netflix series which people were freaking out about uh, it was weird because i'm like you guys never speak out against disney but some daredevil fans were freaking out about it on twitter and i'm like well, what'd you guys expect honestly what do you expect yeah. this isn't netflix producing this anymore yeah i do notice that actually daredevil fans seem to be a little bit more honest from from what i've noticed well there's a bigger uh, overlap there in fan bases i notice a lot of snyder fans are daredevil fans right yeah yeah and even i'm kind of hard on daredevil like I like the show. I'm not going to pretend like I wasn't watching it and and hyping it and tweeting about it when it came out, as it came out. I watched the first two seasons on the every, you know, the binge of both both of them as soon as they came out. But looking back on it, I have criticisms, which I'm not going to go into now. But it's it wasn't as edgy as you guys thought it was. It was just as a Snyder fan, we felt like it was our moral obligation to, like, support daredevil because it was the only inkling that we would ever see marvel characters that were legitimately adult oriented and i guess that and and it was there was some truth to that but if you look back at it it really isn't as adult 
and I'm not talking about explicitness, but it's, it really wasn't as adult as people were making out to be. But we can we can get into that at another episode or an <laughs> Exiles Network episode or something. There you go. That's an idea right there. <laughs> yeah. We have some Kevin Smith news as in an episode of Fat Man Beyond, he shared a rough outline of some of his upcoming events that are going to be at his newly purchased movie theater from when he was growing up. I believe it's in Jersey. Included screenings and Q&As with George R.R. R. Martin, the Russo brothers, and Zack Snyder. So in the episode, he mentioned... One of these things is not like the other. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I was like, I was like, well, how'd you get Zack on there? But then I remembered that he and Zack right. showed him the bat suit before it was publicly revealed and i remember kevin talking about that on fat man beyond yeah. and how he couldn't say it was called fat man on batman back then and how he couldn't say what it was but it was from a old comic book and now we know it's a dark knight returns suit but in the episode he he talks about how he texted zach and asked him if this is still his number and he said yes it is and he's like hey would you like to come and do a screening for or a commentary and a Q&A afterward and, and it's like yeah sure and Kevin's like okay what would you like to screen I think he Kevin might have suggested Army of the Dead or something like that and Zach came back with why don't we screen that movie that didn't come out in theaters and that was all he said so they're they're going to screen the Snyder Cut at, at a future time he did not give us a month for Zach's screening but that might be the first I don't know if it is but that might be the first time that we get the no, Snyder Cut on the big screen theatrical. I think yeah, I think that there were there were some people putting it like this is as official as I think it's going to get because it's kind of like promoted by the the filmmaker himself. But I think there were actually some theaters that were that were streaming it. Yeah, I think there were some private IMAX screenings that because there right. are some theaters that you can buy out the theater and put whatever movie you want on. And I think a lot some fans did that. I remember seeing people buying tickets for fan private screenings on Twitter. Yeah, it was not, yeah. none of, none of it was official. different. Right. Yeah. And he's involved and it's a screening and maybe, a, I don't think it's a commentary, but a screening and then a Q and a, I'm, I'm not a, a huge Kevin Smith fan these days, but this might be one I tune into because you know, Zach can't help himself. We'll get some new information, at least about the Snyder cut, at least about yeah. the lore or how it connects to the previous two movies. And maybe he'll get asked about the future and he'll leave it vague or maybe we'll get something out of it. But for that, I, I did get a little bit excited because that might be the next point at which we get some more, you know, gas in our tanks, at least for me. Oh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you get fed, you know? Yeah, I, I think so, too. I would definitely check it out. I mean, I, I showed up for Teen Titans Go. Hell yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm absolutely going to show up for this. I mean, yeah, there's there's no doubt. All right. I also noticed that Mark Bernardin, who is not a Zach fan, <laughs> his reaction was just deadpan <laughs> when he was announcing that. I'm like, yeah, fuck <laughs> you, Mark. <laughs> I don't know who that is. But that's funny. That That's his co-host. Yeah. And he's also a Star Trek writer now. He's on Star Trek Discovery, I think. Oh, wow. not not. He's the reason I stopped <laughs> listening to the to, to his show. <laughs> oh, boy. We have some David Zaslav news as through a Warner Brothers Discovery town hall meeting. He stated after all this news that was coming out about his eventual plan is to sell off to Comcast, which I, I still believe is the plan, but we're probably many years away from that happening. He has to make this profitable first. But he stated, quote, we are not for sale. Absolutely not for sale. We have the strongest hand in the industry. We have everything we Crap. need to be successful, <laughs> to be the biggest entertainment media company in the world, end quote. And I think he's referring to IPs like probably potential oh, is what he's oh, referring yeah. to. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. So yes, they do have the biggest hand, which is cursed and has been continuously squandered. It just feels like forever now. But yeah, no, it's it's hilarious. It'd be so funny if we had this big inversion where they ended up in the same situation as Marvel, where they were forced to sell off their pro their properties, and they went through this big dark period. And then, sometime in the future, when we're old grandpas, they buy it back, and then they become like the underdog, and it all happens over again. But th by that by that time, I'm not even sure if entertainment will look the same way as it does now. But no, <laughs> and there won't be a Snyderverse. <laughs> I don't think at that point. Like, <laughs> oh yeah, oh, yeah. No, definitely start movies. Do you think this is more a statement for him to? get the investors more or less less panicky like hey, stop selling we're not we're not selling a comcast relax we're still 
we're not just buying these properties to immediately flip them over to whomever is the biggest bidder, or in that case, Comcast. Is this more of a statement of we plan on doing things with these brands and we'll talk about selling in 10 years? You know, the thing about David is that he always talks a big game, but he says absolutely nothing. There are there are pressing things on the minds of Warner Brothers audiences, mm -hmm. movie audiences in general, DC audiences specifically, that we want to know about, right? And he's no different than any of the many of executives that have been in his place before him, in that they all just beat around the bush and string you along indefinitely. And the thing is, it's like, okay, what we want to know is, what is your plan? Like here, here's a great thing that everyone wants to know. Every single soul who yeah. watches specifically comic book movies wants to know, what is your plan to differentiate yourself from your biggest competition? Like, how about that? How would you sit down on a, on a tell all interview and you, you cough up the details that we all want to know about until then I'm not going to take this guy seriously. I, I couldn't care less. You know, he, he just, he's, he's trying to clean up and I get it. Yeah. But it's like you could argue that the last guy was trying to clean up. Mm -hmm. It's like because they're they're constantly selling out so quick that no one has any time to do anything before they actually get themselves established. You know, like, whose fault is it that this franchise is in shambles? It's like, I don't know. It's a, it's a culture of problems. Start telling us your incentives. Start telling us your what you ex what you want to do, your plans. And that will get me on board or I won't. But until then, it's like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not buying it. It's funny that you bring up these new buyers because Scott Snyder from Dark Knight's Metal and Batman and all that was just on Word Balloon. And he was talking about how in the comic industry, when AT&T bought up Warner Brothers, there were orders from higher ups of this is what we expect. This is what we're trying to sell. Please set these properties up. And it's like, okay, that's going to take a while. So while they're working on setting up these changes in the comics and in the lore to fit those agendas and that's six months down the line that you're going to see these books or these plans sometimes a year and he's like and all of a sudden now discovery are the new ones and they have their own plans and different agendas and it's like okay well now those plans that we had for at t are reflecting on our work but that wasn't what we wanted to do those were mandates and now they have to catch up and and now catch up to the agenda of discovery in that case so he's like right now it's just not fun to he was mentioning that he wants to write for DC, he wants to write for Marvel, and he wants to be an exclusive at one one of the big two, but that it's just not in the cards right now, especially with the way Disney and now currently Discovery operate. Yeah, it's it's hard to say. With David Zaslav's plan, I, I do want to, I, I too want to know the answers. I want to know what his 10-year plan is. I, I do have a little bit of patience because as you already brought up, there is a lot of cleanup happening. Hamada's out. At some point this month, I think the 24th or something like that. So it might be until then that they can start rolling out some of these plans or ideas. But let's pretend that David, and he probably does have the power to do this, is like, I, I can just tell you guys what I want to do. I, I don't care. I don't answer. Who do I answer to aside from investors and the higher ups at Discovery? I'm in charge of all this. So if he were to tell us a plan after the flash, because that's the other problem is we still have to get through bland Adam. We have to get through the flush and we have to get through. I, I feel like there's one more in between. Oh, Shazam too. So we still have to get through those three, which are still Hamadaverse movies as much as people want to pretend that no, they're being fixed. They're being altered to be into the Snyderverse. So that's his plan is to continue the Snyderverse with or without Zach. So it's a good thing. And we need to support these things. That's yeah. bullshit. And you've heard it from me uh, on here several times, but let's say that, that that is what's happening. If he were to, what would be the pros and cons to him saying after flash, we do plan on bringing Zach back. Would that negatively impact the current movies? Would that positively impact the current movies? Does he want to capitalize on these releases first before he yeah. talks about his Great tenure question. plan? You're asking some good questions that we actually, like, no one's talking about these things. Like, it's always, yeah, anyway. I would say this. Before I even get to the answer to that, there is a third option that I would actually consider, right? A world where he says no. We will not continue the Snyderverse mm -hmm. definitively, right? However, with as much fervor and as much definitiveness as he says that, he also says that we will not 
chase after and tug on the coattails of Disney. Okay. If he said, we are going to differentiate ourselves to be a alternative option from Disney and what they're doing. And he meant it as much as he means that, Hey, we're not going to re- renew the Snyderverse. I would take my licks. I would, you know, I would mourn, but I would, I would have some confidence because the problem is, is that I feel like a lot of what has happened with Snyder from the beginning has been very tied into the whole culture that started with the Avengers and the MCU, you know, and it's all been tied in. And now we have, you know, MCU's Feige's goons in our lots and stuff like that. You know, I I think if he can put his foot down, like, Hey, I want to make product for these demographics and I'm going to commit to that. And I want, you know, and I'm not going to do this four quadrant, like action comedy bull crap, you know, spiel that Disney keeps on recycling. Then I think that's something that we should, I'm not going to wait for it, but in the event that it does happen, if that were under that criteria, I would be willing to accept it. Now, to answer your first question is, if he said, hey, I'm doing the Snyderverse thing, would it negatively or positively impact it? I think it won't have any more of a negative impact than their current plan has had. I don't think that it would. I think it all comes down to how they market it how they sell the idea and how committed they are to sticking it through. That's what I, I think that it w- really matters. You know, I tried to play this scenario too. And, and based on what people say on Twitter, based on how we've reacted as a fan base, or at least the ones that have been there since BVS and whatnot of these little boycotts or wars or whatever you want to call them. And if they, if he were to say, yeah, we're bringing Zach back and it's going to be at some point in the future, I know there would be a good amount of Snyder fans that would come out for these movies again. They would the boycott would be over. Let's okay, fine. I'll watch Black Adam out of morbid curiosity. Or I'm a DC fan at the end of the day, and I I, I would have watched this anyway if well, all of this wasn't happening. Yeah. So I, I think that the box office was, would be higher for these films. I know I I don't know if I I can say I would go to go and watch these myself, but I would have I wouldn't be fighting them as much. I wouldn't be making fun of the rock as, as much as I am or any of these other people or the Battinson movies, I would be like, okay, well I'm getting my thing later. I don't, I don't care. Like, it's cool. Yeah. Like, you know, we're cool. Well, this is the thing, right? I think that at the end of the day, I think that people who watch the DC movies as they are, I don't think that they are concerned about the movies they're getting being they're, they're, like Snyder poses no threat to those movies. You know, you know what I'm trying to say? Like, like for instance, Black Adam, that movie has no identity at all. No. So if you're watching that movie, you're simply watching it because it exists. I'm sure there are Marvel and DC fans that are watching that movie and or who are playing to watch the movie. And they're just going to, you know, they're going to have something to talk about on Twitter the next day. And they're going to do that for whatever comes out. So there's no harm in having Snyder come back. I mean, it's not like, oh no, it's like, if Snyder comes back, then I'm not going to get any more Black Adams. It's like, no, no no one's saying that. No one even thinks that. They're not concerned. But we are concerned that the more Black Adams we get, the less likely there is to be a Snyder verse. So, I think that it disproportionately behooves us to make sure that we get Snyder back into his uh, rightful place. (laughs) And maybe some of that, too, is all of this cost cutting, which we are going to talk about as our final p- portion of the news in a little bit. But the cost cutting that's happening right now, I think because of that, they're not putting in numbers yet for some projects past Blue Beetle, I think is the last or most recent one, or maybe Wonder Woman 3, even though they said that was happening, whatever, Constantine 2. There's a couple of these projects, but as far as like the films that are a part of his 10-year plan that he talked about, he wanted a universe that's connected and that was one of the things that he had mentioned. Maybe some of that won't come about until the quarter's up, maybe until Hamada's gone. But I think the last question I do want to ask you, and I, I think that you and I lie in the same path of we're not going to see anything just because it's DC. We also look at the quality of who's involved in these things. But for for me personally, like people are saying, okay, why are you boycotting these movies anymore? Aside from Zach's not back because Hamada's gone, and they they, they call they've been, I've seen this on Twitter. We're chasing ghosts or fighting ghosts is what they're saying. 
And uh, what's what's your response to that? If you are at all still involved in non-interest or in any kind of boycott with some of these DC movies? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm I'm genuinely not interested in Black Adam. It, it I haven't been watching a lot of movies, perhaps movies that I should be watching. And of those movies, Black Adam is not one of them. So I, that's not even on my radar. Now, in regards to with the whole Zack Snyder thing, like, let's say that Black Adam is good. It's it's a good movie. By whatever measure you want to say a movie could be good. I You know, I'm not going to qualify that right now. But let's say it's a good movie. Would I watch it is the question. And the answer is no, because the criteria was always to bring Zack back. It's not, oh, we want good movies. It's funny how a lot of DC fans that I know who are who are my mutuals, who are on my timeline, who talk to me, and I respect. But it's funny how a lot of them have pivoted from, oh, we want Zack back to, oh, we want good movies. We just want good movies. Like, you hear that all the time. Yeah, like we all don't want good movies, you know. But the, the criteria was that we were trying to get Zack back. So in order to follow up with that, the boycott is saying, hey, if you don't bring Zach back, then we know we will not give you no money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Simple as that, you know? Yep. So it's like, do you want Zach back or not? It's actually that simple. And by by watching movie these movies, you're saying that you don't care if he comes back. Right. It's like, listen, the Batman, I've said this multiple times on the TL, looks like a well put together film. It's got decent production value, the acting and all that. Do did I would I have agreed with all the specific artistic choices they made probably not but it's like i watch movies where i i have mixed feelings that's not the point i'm here for zach you know so that's it well we still got a few weeks before the end of october we may be watching the battinson movie if they restore the snyderverse this month yeah. <laughs> was it this that, month or this year yeah. i don't remember <laughs> i made i made a i made like a dare or a better whatever behind the scenes that i would watch it under a certain very specific criteria that favors me very much because uh, absolutely not. yeah <laughs> <laughs> I think I shared it with with Sam or one of my coworkers, and he was like, "Oh, you got this locked down. <laughs> You're not going to be watching no Batman." <laughs> yeah, we got that. We we hedged our bets quite well. <laughs> <laughs> but our final news story here is follows along with Crunchyroll, which I know you're a subscriber of. The following shows have been removed from Adult Swim's website as part of the Warner Brothers Discovery merger. So these include Blade Runner, Black Lotus. Fina, Pirate Princess, Laser, Wolf, Shenmue the Animation, and Tigtone. Some of these major anime originals will still be available on Crunchyroll as part of the existing partnership between the two companies. But are you at all affected by some of these changes and removals? And do you think that this means they will next be off of Crunchyroll when that contract expires? I doubt it. I think the way that it works is Adult Swim went into business with Crunchyroll to kind of like cross promote. But I think that these are actually Crunchyroll exclusives. You know, okay. I did watch Black Lotus. I watched Fena. I watched uh, Shin Movie Animation. I didn't watch Laser Roll for TikTok. I don't, I don't know what those are. But because they've always done this kind of thing where like Adult Swim and Crunchyroll, where they've had kind of like a, 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 like a co-ownership. But I don't think that Adult Swim relinquishing the rights means that Crunchyroll is going to relinquish the rights, you know, because it, it is an exclusive. Like, what is it? Is it a like if Adult Swim is relinquishing their streaming rights and it's an Adult Swim content, like imagine Adult Swim content only being Crunchyroll and it's exclusive to Adult Swim. Like, that doesn't make sense. So I don't know. I mean, I, I don't I don't actually know the specific legal you know, legality behind it, but that's why I was uh, confused because I saw Black Lotus on HBO Max. But if it's a Crunchyroll exclusive, then. Is it? Are you saying that they own the rights to then sell these streaming rights to places like HBO Max, even though it's left pocket or right pocket? But will it at, at default will it still be a Crunchyroll animation? Well, that so a, HBO made a deal with Crunchyroll, so that's the reason why the content is on there. It's Got on it. HBO. Got it. It's because they made a deal with Crunchyroll, and Crunchyroll is owned by AT and T, mm-hmm. right? So. No, Adult Swim is kind of like a marketing deal. It's not the same. Like, there's no, you know, I, it's 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 kind of strange. Like, for instance, there's a new show coming out called, uh, it's it's by uh, Junji Ito Uzumaki. It's a horror anime coming out soon, where it's also exclusive to Anna Crunchyroll and Adult Swim. 
and it'll be coming out soon. But I, I don't know. I, I don't know why they, Adult Swim would be getting rid of it. I do know that they don't have a like a massive collection of anime. I just know that they, every once in a while they get into a deal with Crunchyroll where they kind of cross promote their stuff. But Crunchyroll always keeps everything, you know. <laughs> have you been as worried? I know Scott's talked about this on well on our meetups, but have you been as worried about some of the cutbacks that have been happening at Warner Brothers Discovery as far as animation is concerned? My concern is that all of these animations are streaming exclusives. It doesn't have to do with the cutbacks specifically. I mean, we're already in dog duty right now. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's already like to the point, like these are just the things that we should have come to expect. I would say not necessarily. Also, I don't have HBO Max. I do have Crunchyroll and everything that you can watch will pretty much be on there. So the things that I'm most concerned about is moves that Crunchyroll are are making now i will say that there is something to be said about other streaming platforms like netflix and whatnot who are also doing quite a good job with their own exclusives one of them which we'll talk about later but i think that like scott they should start releasing these physically so that way we can own them but i don't think that will happen no <laughs> they want you to get that sub <laughs> right where well, there you have it everyone a lot of movement in the industry behind the scenes especially and still very to me very fascinating how with the things that come out of this merger both good and bad and with stuff even like disney like this blade thing i'm on the sidelines eating popcorn like this is hilarious <laughs> to me <laughs> yeah it's like it's pretty much we've been new you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> let's head into the final portion of today's podcast the broke up block what millennial mike and i have been up to since you last heard us so first i want to highlight a patreon comment from adrian c who commented on last week's episode and said quote i am not a deadpool fan either i saw the first film it was all right i wasn't in a hurry for deadpool 2 still haven't seen it with game of thrones never seen it don't plan on it if a series ending made me mad i want nothing to do with that series for example i used to be a fan of the series supernatural but the way they ended my favorite character two episodes before the finale, I was pissed and just never watched the final episode. Now they have a prequel coming and I'm not planning on watching it. Good podcast, guys. End quote. So just wanted to share that bit of feedback mm. because as you mentioned earlier, <laughs> that feeds us. <laughs> it puts gas in my tank. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you. And you mentioned some of the originals with Netflix, Cyberpunk Edge Runners. It is one that I'm on episode six, I want to say, of the 10 episode series. I immediately hit you up on Discord and said, Yeah, I think you'll like this series if you haven't seen it yet. And you had already mm -hmm. talked about how much you enjoyed it. So I talked about it last week and how I said that I'm not really the demographic for the show, but people are loving it. And uh, I do want to hear your thoughts on it since I, I know you enjoyed it quite a bit. Right, right. I, I, I really did enjoy it. Uh, recently, I was on Renegade Pop Culture Podcast with you know a few of my friends that we can you know maybe plug that later on but I, I talked a little bit about a little bit about it actually not as much as i may have would have liked to but the show is really good one of the things that i think is noteworthy or worthy of talking about is how people are comparing it to arcane which is also not damn <laughs> demographic what a weird thing to compare it to <laughs> well not necessarily they're both adult oriented animations that <laughs> touch on you know that so they're video game adaptations sure adult oriented adaptations and they both have mostly english spoken sound like an english spoken soundtrack so it kind of has that sort of same vibe they're both kind of dystopian in a lot of ways uh -huh. one's more steampunk the other one is cyberpunk so there's some things to be made. They're both limited series. So the length is about the same. Nine, yes. episode, nine episodes for an hour a piece. This one is 10 episodes for 30 minutes, 40 minutes a piece. So Arcane's a little bit longer. But but yeah, no, they're, they're, they're similar in a lot of ways. So I would say that like, but they're not similar in the most important ways in that this is good, but Arcane is is like actually pushing the... It's elevating the yes. It's it's elevating the 
the platform, the the medium for sure. This is a really if you've ever seen trigger animation, mm-hmm. like Kill a okay. Kill or Gurren Lagan, those well, that kind of I heard yeah. I'm hearing that fans of that studio have watched this and gone, okay, this is what I expect. Exactly. Exactly. It's it's very much what you expect, which is greatness. I mean, like let's not get it twisted. Mm-hmm. Trigger is amazing animation, and and you like them because of this very very reason. But it, it's not like, you know. And it was good. It was probably actually one of their their better animations. I saw, you know, brand new animal. I watched a little bit of Kill a Kill. I just didn't. I wasn't a big fan of it. And and Gurren Lagann was was their first kind of project. It was right before they split. They used to be called a, a company called Gainax, and then part of them split off to become Trigger. So you some people put. Gurren Lagan in the Trigger camp, although Gurren Lagan is literally better than anything that, the, that Trigger has ever done. So I don't even <laughs> put them in the same camp. And Trigger's pretty good, but Gurren Lagan was a masterpiece. So, but yeah, no, um, really great show. I, I don't know what to say without spoiling it. It's pretty short. The, there's not like, from from my personal perspective, the show is not like, it's not dense. Like, okay, I, I didn't want to say it was not deep because there are like elements of like, you know, the, kind of the ghost in the shell complex mm-hmm. that that most cyberpunk, you know, movies and TV shows Blade Runner talk about. They talk about like, you know, what is your soul, your essence? Like, who are you? Who am I? Am I just the, that, that's always the discussion that's always had with these kinds of things. And that's what the game I, I would imagine probably talks and the augmentations and like your disassociation disassociation with humanity and all that it goes in all those things so if you like that kind of stuff you like this and it has a really great flair to it the tones wildly change and it really leaves you with a gut punch at the end which i think a lot of people appreciate so i definitely think it's it's certainly worth it although i do wish it was a little bit more dense in like subtext and yeah dense in subtext but kind of like our yeah i mean i will yeah, yeah, like really go like into the symbolism and the and the yeah. depth and the the commentary and the social and the the interactions. Like this wasn't like that. It's pretty straightforward and it has a some of the themes that you would expect it to have, and it's done very well. Like it's you know it's very great production value. But but yeah, no, it's absolutely it, even all that said, it's probably the best anime of the year. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yeah, all that said, you know, so I'm not, just not just Netflix, you know. but anime in general. And I know you watch a lot of those. Yeah, yeah, I would say it's it's probably anime of the year. There's not a lot. There's a few other ones that could, but this one is just so well put together, and it's just beginning, middle, and end, and it all came out at once. So you get to kind of watch like a movie. Mm-hmm. I think that this is going to leave a more of an impact on people than other shows. Yeah, that I agree with. And it's already done wonders for the game. It Once this show came out, the game peaked higher than The Witcher 3 as far as number of people playing it, and which was a, a pretty big record for The Witcher 3. And, and a lot of people either went back to Cyberpunk after having played the game and saw the show and they're like, all right, I, I've got a niche. I got to get to back to the game. Or people saw the show, loved it, and then went oh, there's a game for it. I, I heard about that. Okay, now I kind of get what it's about and then jumped in. The The companies were smart enough in which they have since put in an update where there are elements from the show now in the game. You can get some content like street clothes or whatever that match some of these characters. And I think there's some locations from the show specifically that are now in the game. So they're doing some smart things here. They were pretty quick about it, whether or not it was planned. I don't know. I'm sure it was. Yeah. And, and they kind of, it paid off for them that the show was as big as it was. So good on, good on them for at least bringing some more attention to the game, which I know was suffering quite a bit from its debut, at least. Yeah. You know, what's kind of funny if you have some time still, it's fun because I was thinking about playing the game after watching it, but then I thought about it. I'm like, no, it's like I, I'm not actually interested in, wa- in playing that game. <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> but now like, you can be an edge runner. Well, yeah, that that's the thing. It's like you know, you, your your lizard brain is kind of like, ooh, it's like I like cyberpunk game. I like cyberpunk show. It's <laughs> yeah. like content you consume, you know. <laughs> but it's like no, the game actually doesn't interest me. And the same thing with Arcane. It's like. And that's the thing I like about Arcane and it's the thing I like about this is that it's almost as though because the anime, the animation doesn't represent the game, that's why the animation is good. (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, it's like it's not just you can't take a video game and make it into a good show. You have to make a good show and you loosely based on some of the themes of the video game. Exactly. And it's so good that people who like the game will also like this just independently. You know, you don't have to play the game to like either or. And a lot of people will be like marketed into playing the game. And maybe some of those people who would have liked the game anyway will find a game that now they are getting to play that they like. But for many of us who would never have played that game are still not going to play it. (laughs) Well, and a good example of I'm glad you brought that up because no one criticizes cyberpunk or arcane for not being enough like the game yet halo season one gets criticized for not being like the game and it's like you it's a good show all three of these are good shows they don't have to be like the fucking games but for some reason only one of them gets criticized for that which i think well i will say this arcane is leagues above edge runners right and edge runners is leagues above halo (laughs) i liked halo we talked about this (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> but in my opinion, just the overall production value, the tightness of the script, like Halo had some problems, some pacing problems, some just kind of standard TV issues where they're just mm-hmm. trying to fill space with stuff, and some TV level acting at times, some less than good effects because of budgeting and whatnot. That Arcane, like Arcane and and Edge Runners, are completely holistic, fully realized projects that. Their flaws are so minute, like they're just complete whole products. There's no issues with dips in animation budget or like they planned everything out ahead and everything is consistent all the way through. Whereas Halo feels like it it has issues, which I, I, I'm noticing a lot of shows because they, they were bragging about how much money they spent on Halo, right? Yeah. I haven't watched Rings of Power. Tell me if I'm rambling. I don't want to. No, put you no, over. you're good. <laughs> but I've been hearing that Rings of Power has been having issues with their budgeting, like getting everything to be consistent. And it just seems like, oh, you know, you'll spend billions of dollars, you know, on these some of these shows, and you still have issues with making everything look consistent. And you still have issues with TV level acting and just droning on for for time and stuff. It's like, listen, you could have planned all this out ahead of time. I don't get why that's still an issue. So when you have shows like Arcane and and edge runners, which are just like paced perfectly, and it's just one one experience, and you just you consume it, and it's like wow, that was just the whole thing was great. It just you know, Halo actually does look kind of bad, like compared to it, but even still, it's still better than a lot of the the ilk that we see on streaming platforms now. Yeah, and and all the things you brought up that that might be fair criticisms for Halo are still not the things being said about Halo. They're still, again, they're still saying, well, it's not enough like the game. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, I, I, uh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. A, a strong recommendation from Millennial Mike on Cyberpunk Edge Runners if you, for some reason, haven't seen it. And I will say, I, w- I will finish off this season or this series. It sounded like there might not be a season two from what you were saying about the ending. But if it's successful enough, they can make up something with a new character unless they obliterated the world, which even then you can do or, a prequel. Instead of doing Joker 2 with everything, you can just make another project in the spirit of Edge Runners, you know? Like, I'm so tired of sequels, man. Ugh. Hey, we got to make more money, man. (laughs) Okay, then let's cancel Arcane Season 2. Let's let's go ahead and do that. (laughs) Well, I mean, Edge Runners came to an end, you know? Like, I don't know. Yeah, Yeah, it sounds like it's more of an ending. No, you caught me. You caught me. (laughs) I'll, I'll take that. I'll take it to the chin. Well, I, I, I'll finish it and maybe I'll see what you're saying after after I do, because I am that interested, at least in this one. It hasn't it, it didn't give me this case of arcane or my hero where I'm interested in one character and then right. suddenly it's gone. Kind of like what was being said here from Adrian yeah. on, on well, his our, show. Arcane set a bunch of things up like like there were some conclusions, but there were like it's this show is meant to be continued. It's a narrative that. Like, I mean, hey, like, don't ask for them to restore the Snyderverse then. No Justice League 2 and 3. Right, yeah, that's true, yeah. <laughs> like, like, obviously. So I would say that this is probably more in line with that. Whereas Edge Runners, like, if they if they try to extend that, like, they're just, they're just greedy. <laughs> I gotcha, I gotcha. Well, cool, man. Before we go into some of the podcast topics or the podcast awards and the hurricane, because now I'm on the other side of it, uh, please touch on some of the other things that 
you have been watching or have been doing. You mentioned another podcast or even mm -hmm. some stuff that you've got coming up with Scott even. You know what? I haven't got to talk about this yet with really anyone. So I'll use the opportunity. Digimon Survive. So if any of you guys have heard Digimon Survive, it's basically this half tactical, half visual novel Digimon game. And as we all know, Digimon games are either completely in the gutter or they're actually pretty good. Like I heard Cyber Souls was pretty good. Although that, that wasn't the one that I picked up. I picked up this one. And it's it's kind of it's kind of terrible. Now, there, <laughs> <laughs> the tactics of this game, if you guys are interested or if you've seen it before, the tactics of the game, you know, standard kind of top down kind of, you know, corner above, you know, down grid layout. You can move this far, you can attack this far, kind of board game style thing. This it's great, but there's not really a lot of that in there. And I was actually personally defending this game before it came out, before I played it on the merit that I was really interested in a Digimon game full of stakes where the decisions that you make can ultimately have an impact on all your characters to the mm -hmm. point where they can actually be killed from the story, which as far as I know, although I haven't gotten to that point yet, can still happen. And it was serious. It was dramatic. It was a visual novel. I was like, Defending it, I'm like, hey, if this game ends up being like that, and it's a story driven game, that's fine. And if they and if to top all that off, it adds some actually cool tactic compact, then I was like, we're in for a treat. But ultimately, what it is is some decent tactic combat, you know, pretty standard run of the mill tactics combat mm -hmm. with some terrible, I mean, just straight down, just garbaggio dialogue. I mean, just AI generated trash. Oh, shit. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's 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 really really frustrating, and I, I expect that Digimon represent themselves better, especially with all the accusations from the Pokemon fans being levied against us. We need better games to, to stand up. You know, you're not doing a lot for me here, but it's just like, yeah, like uh, to give you an example, it's like one person does or says something about what they not even about something that they're doing or has happened, but something that they're going to do. So it's usually like, oh, you know, we're we're going to. We need to find this person. They're they've been taken. They're lost. Oh yeah, like oh she must be so scared. You know, it's like oh come on guys, we have to get it together. You know, let's make a plan. So like, okay, what would we? What, what would so such and such do? Where where could they? Like just dumb, useless. You could literally make up a whole conversation like I just did, where you're just saying nothing, and that's everything. Like I found the only way to make it bearable because what I was doing. It was like on most of these games, you hit like the space bar and that like skips. Like you're like, you know, the little text scrolls across the screen, you know, mm -hmm. and you hit it and go, da -da 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 -da, and then you keep clicking it and it scrolls across the screen. Well, there's an auto option. <laughs> the auto option makes it bearable. So if you end up playing the game, I would say leave the auto option on. There's still way too much dialogue in there. None of it means anything. The story isn't that great. The characters aren't relatable. I mean, it's literal just the, the trailers were so good. The dramatic music playing in the background and like they just picked the best scenes to put in the trailer. But that's just not how the game ended up being at all. So I have to save you and let you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you brought in criticism about it because all that I've gotten as far as what people thought about this new Digimon game was what I was hearing from Scott, which was. People thought that this was a game, and the whole time they've been advertising it as a visual novel. That's why people don't like this game. And I'm like, okay, that makes sense. But you're saying that even the visual novel aspect is, is <laughs> yeah. not good. I talked to Scott about it, and it was so funny because he was so he was so light on it. Now, at the time that I talked to him, he said he didn't really play the game much. But I actually told him about this criticism. I said, you know, and, and at the time, I wasn't as sure as I am now about how bad it was. I was going to bring it to Scott, like seeing what he thought. Like, hey, Scott, like uh, this, this, you know, visual novel is a little, little trash, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, oh, you know, yeah, I mean, they, they probably, you know, the company, they had Namco, they don't really do visual novels or whatever. So they're probably just not used to it, you know. Oh, yeah. But I mean, it's so trash that. The fact that it's ninety percent of the game is going to make me stop playing, right? <laughs> you know? And I, yeah, because I was like, I'm, I'm telling you, I was on Scott's side. I was like, listen, this game is 
a visual novel. And that is how they advertised it. And I was definitely defending it on that merit, but it's just, it's complete trash. I, I hadn't played a lot of visual novels and there haven't been very many good ones that I've played. Check out Stein's Gate if you, if you haven't checked out one. That should be like anyone's first visual novel, but, but yeah, this was just terrible. So yeah, it's just not, it just, no one's going to play it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so sad. It kills me. I like Digimon. Right. And that's something Scott was saying too. He's like, if they don't, if this doesn't succeed, not only will they not do more in this style, at least, but they're that might jeopardize future Digimon games. Yeah, I mean, they they definitely will know why people aren't playing it because it's just kind of like, I mean, who knows? The, the The company could take the wrong thing from it, but everyone's like, oh, we don't want visual novels. So they're never going to make a visual novel ever again, right. probably, which is like maybe it's for the best or they should just get a different studio. <laughs> But I don't know how how it works with Digimon, where like I don't know if they like hire different studios to do different projects. Like the Pokemon Company, they have like different companies that yeah. do the games, right? Yeah, they yeah. definitely do. So, and and you can we'll notice see. it when they do when they do some of the mainline games, and it's like okay, this was definitely not done by Game Freak; it was done by someone else, and you can tell, right? But they they seem to have some kind of quality of standard though, where. Even though it's different, I know Scott really doesn't like Legends Arceus, but there's a lot of people that did, and that was done by a different studio. So that's one of those things that that at least they're they're trying to protect the brand in that way, right? Yeah. So we'll we'll see. It, it, it pains me. I the we'll, we'll chalk one up to the Pokemon fans. You know, they win. <laughs> <laughs> Got another one. Yes, <laughs> it feels good being on the other side, on the winning side for once. I didn't know that it, this was a competition between <laughs> Digimon and Pokemon anymore. But <laughs> so what what else have you been up to then since you you were last on i've taken up dance classes oh so no shit <laughs> yeah yeah ballroom dance swing salsa waltz foxtrot you know that kind of thing uh, what else is there uh tango I, I went in there mostly for mostly for swing and single single time swing to be more specific i had a group of friends who we went out and went dancing and it was a lot of fun like hey you know what i want to I want to pursue this a little bit further. So I went and said, Hey, you know, I want to learn swing. And they're like, look, look, what kind of swing do you want to learn? And I'm like, Oh, that's a great <laughs> question. I, I do not know. <laughs> You're like, and I'm on the kinda, deep end already. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I, I literally don't know. I, I just wanted to do something new, just do something crazy and just, you know, live and learn. Yeah. So, okay. So they showed me East coast and West coast swing, which the basic difference is that East coast swing has more steps and it's faster. And single time, otherwise known as West Coast Swing. Actually, there is a slight difference, but there's a big overlap. But I'm not an expert, so don't take my word for it precisely. But that's a little bit slower, and there are less steps. So it's pretty cool, though. But very, very fun, and it's great, um, a great social thing to do. So definitely recommend it. If you, you know, build your confidence, build your, your mm -hmm. coordination, hand, you know, you know, great, great way to meet other people and. Yeah, lots of lots of benefits. Exercise. Did I say yes. that already? No, no, you didn't. That's a good one though. It's good benefit. Yeah. Dancing is is huge. Cardio, tons of cardio and in, in dancing. That's for sure. Okay, so there's something called smooth form. So like on dances like the waltz, what you're gonna do is you're gonna hold your as a leader. Well, yeah, as a leader, you're gonna hold your hand, and it's almost gonna be up to your eye level. Okay. The thing about that is, is that you have to hold it, your hand, your arm in this, like imagine holding your arm like directly out to the side, mm -hmm. right? Imagine holding it like a little bit higher and slightly bent, not totally bent towards a 90 degree angle, but slightly bent to where you have like the most amount of like resistance yep. on your arm, like from the weight. You have to essentially hold that pose the entire time. Just that alone wears your arm out. Like I didn't realize how much. So that they teach you when, when you first start doing dance, you just hold your partner's hands just down at your waist, right? But then as you start to get the feet work and all that, they'll move you on to what's called a frame. And that's where you work on the upper body stuff. And yeah, that that's a lot of work. So like if you didn't think that you you get, you know, arm exercises by doing like stuff like the waltz, you are sorely mistaken, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> and you will be sore in places you didn't know you could be sore. You're using muscles you didn't know you could use. Right, right. But yeah, lots of fun. 
Good, man. That's awesome. That's very good. You'll have to, as, as you continue to pursue this, you know, maybe you'll, maybe you'll be like Koj and put up some <laughs> dance videos <laughs> on your YouTube or something. <laughs> you kind of yeah, I'm brave enough. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you are hearing this, so we made it through Hurricane Ian down here in Florida. I did learn today that it was considered the in the top five of most intense hurricanes in Florida, is, is what I, I think. May, mm. might be it may be in the U.S. I'm not too sure, but for sure in Florida is what I think I heard Bobby say earlier. And that's, that's what I was like, oh, man, like I, I've gone through Irma, and you heard that on the show several years back. And then I think before that was Matthew. And we went through that and we lived through that too. But this one, we ended up being fortunate on my end. I recorded last week's and I tried to, and I did end up succeeding in editing it, uploading it before any loss of power or destruction <laughs> was my goal. I'm like, this thing <laughs> is scheduled. It's going have out. any, was there any damage or? So we got lucky overall. We had a very messy backyard from all kinds of branches and leaves and all of that. But we ended up picking up everything that might have gotten picked up by the wind and we put it out inside or we put it in the garage. And then we had some, I noticed some leaks in the garage. And that's one thing that I'm like, okay, well, if any, if it's going to happen in any place, I'm glad it's in the garage and not inside the home that I've noticed so far. And I haven't gone up to the attic or anything, but I haven't noticed any leaks on the, on the roof from looking up in the house. You can immediately notice it if that were the case. But yeah, that was the the main thing was damage to in between the door that leads into the backyard and the garage, there was water coming in from outside. So that's one thing that I'll have to look at and see where it led to, because I know it went underneath the washer and dryer and it probably met with the wall there. There's not a drainage that goes out of that area. So that was the worst of it. Now, some people did lose power and still don't have power. Bobby just got his power back up this morning. And some, some, my coworkers, they had their parents coming over to take showers because they have no power at their place. And Bobby has no clean water currently. So he's been washing his dishes with boiling water or bottles of water. Mm. Some people were, were hit harder than that. Some pl places in Orlando are flooded still. And you might've seen some of the tweets that I put up of Kirkman, which is right down from Universal Studios. It's, it's flooded with water from these lakes. And some of these problems that are happening is Florida during COVID, a lot of people from New York, a lot of people from California moved to Florida during the shutdown because of policies, because of rent, whatever it may be. And they started developing even faster than normal down here in Florida. So a bunch of these homes that are brand are new. Up to standard. They're not up to standard. They're, oh, they're wow. flooded. There's no drainage in place for these places. So they're, they're being flooded. And that's just a product of what's happening. And it's it's a glaring problem here in Florida. So other people were not as, as lucky as we were. So we were definitely grateful for our outcome at least. But there were a lot of people that are still hurting from that. And we are all affected by it. There's no gas in a lot of places. Supplies are extremely low. At the grocery stores, you're, they're still haven't gotten their shipment of product and replacement in. So it, it's a little tough right now, but they, As we made it through. the supply chain issues weren't already bad enough. Exactly. Like, please, exactly. Please. Right. So we made it through though, and and we're grateful. Everyone's okay for the most part. We're we're alive. We've got most of our health. Uh, Leo and Kelly are going through something. Leo had a reaction to a type of penicillin medicine, unfortunately, but hmm. we've we're getting that squared away, and and just lucky overall. Made it through Hurricane. Right. And, uh, until the next one, <laughs> whenever that is. I don't know how, how or if global warming is affecting that. <laughs> we'll see what the next one is. And the podcast awards, I did want to touch on that in case you missed the stream. Uh, we did not win for this year's Games and Hobbies, but we were nominated still for the sixth year in a row. Thanks to you on the other side for voting. We really do appreciate it. Our hats off to two nerds in a pod for winning Games and Hobbies this year. And doesn't mean we won't continue to try for for winning i'm just grateful again that we even got nominated that's huge for us so we are still 2022 nominated podcast awards and we are a 2019 podcast award winning podcast so really appreciate that all of you who voted all of you who voted in the final slating as well i know that a couple of even co-hosts were chosen to be in that final slating so we do appreciate that and 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 congratulations to all the winners and all the categories for this year's podcast awards. But that's about it on my end, Millennial Mike. Anything else you want to plug away at before we go ahead and close out and give out any social media links that where people can find you? Yeah. 
give Mike K a, a check out. He wor- he works also with the Renegade Pop Coolster podcast. I actually was recently on his podcast and we had a lot of fun. We were just kind of just talking to in the cud about just a variety of different subjects. We went all over the place. He's been a mutual of mine on Twitter, but it was really great to meet him and talk to him for the first time. And that's one of the things that I love about, about podcasting, just getting to meet different people. So definitely check him out. He's at Captain K. K is spelled K-A-Y-E-4-2. So Captain K-42. Definitely give him a check out, as well as the rest of the Renegade Pop Culture group as well. There you go. I'm going to keep this civil. <laughs> Those guys don't like me. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we got I, I did- I didn't yeah. even know that you had anything to do with them. Oh, yeah. How- well, that's probably how you know them, because I used to talk and promote them. One of their guys on there was a subscriber at my comic shop. And then I came to learn because he told me about his podcast. I'm like, oh, I do podcasts, too. And so we exchanged mm. information and I listened to their show and he listened to mine. And we kind of continued communication, connected on Twitter. I connected with his co-hosts and then that's probably where you may have seen some, like a retweet that I might've given. And that's kind of how a lot of us meet, honestly, is through mutuals. But I guess I should just, I should just assume that everyone that I know, everyone else knows them too. There are some people who I know on my, on my Twitter or my my mutuals that like, I don't know any of their people. Like they're literally like, you know, you see like a little infographic where everyone has like a little circle that kind of like these nodes that kind of branch off. Like the node just ends with some people. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> but okay. Well, I I apologize. I didn't mean. Oh to. no, it's all. I I think it's hilarious. <laughs> I think it's funny. No, it was it was it was a uh, anti Snyder stuff that was said, and then I called it out, and it was not taken well. And I did it several times, and that's why it was it kind of blew up. It's funny that. because I have had. Well, we could talk about some of it maybe off there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we're all we're all you know, all peace and love. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I don't, I don't care. I don't mind. I, otherwise, I would have cut all this out. Like if I, if I was really bitter about it, but I'm like, no, it's cool. It's good that you're on another person's show and you get along great with them, and that's awesome. That's good, and absolutely something that I encourage. We are adults. We can, you know, <laughs> absolutely. Unlike some Snyder fans, you know, they don't, they don't understand that. <laughs> and I and maybe I don't with some uh certain people in in the uh, other side of the movement too. So I'm I'm no better. I'm just speaking for myself, but there you have it. And th- well, thank you very much Millennial Mike. Please check out Ronin Console and and his appearance on Renegade Pop Culture as well if you want more Millennial Mike. You can also find them in our Discord and you will find a link to that on the description of today's episode. You find them on there and also on Twitter, but we will have links on everywhere you can find Millennial Mike in the description of today's episode. And this week, if we did just put up a new design for the 10-year anniversary logo, so that is up on our T Public. If you head on over to thereasonsimbroke.com, click on the pull-down menu and click on Merch, you will find a link to the T Public to several designs. They're not just the logo for the show. There's also some stuff in there like Sonic the Hedgehog, Dragon Ball Z, and if you use the link on that T public, a little bit of that kickback heads our way to help cover the costs of the show. And also, can we get a uh, an exclusive ten year anniversary chain, like a gold chain with that look? <laughs> a, a chain? It's not a bad idea. Yeah. The nineties yeah. are coming back, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? You know, and Kelly. Kelly pointed out that at Party City, we are now so old that nineties are a costume. At Party City. <laughs> <laughs> You've made it. You're, yes. You're over, you're over the hill now. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're dust. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you once again for joining us. I've been Daniel with your co-host Millennial Mike and Brocat Core. All will be well. Millennial Mike, have you had any instance like Adrian and I have, where in his case, Supernatural, in my case, my hero, where you got attached to a character and then because of the outcome of that character or a change, I know I had that with Daredevil, Kingpin changed a lot by the time that finale came about and I really liked that character, but he became really irredeemable in that finale for season one that I stopped watching because of that. Have you had an instance like that as you've seen anime or a TV show where a character gets killed off or changed and you completely stop the show. 
No, probably not. I mean, typically, I kind of have a good idea of what I'm going to like before I go in. And if something crazy happens to a certain character, I mean, like, I'm not typically going to watch a show that goes on so long that, like, the ratings are going to affect it, usually. Because I don't typically like those shows. So, like, if I'm watching a show, they're like, you know what? We need to switch things up. We need to do something crazy so that way people keep watching. Well, that usually doesn't happen in the shows that I watch. So... I'd probably say no. I typically perform more self-contained stuff. But if something crazy happens and changes, if it's self-contained, if they do a good job with it, I would say they probably plan everything out to where it's it, it naturally hits that spot. And then by the time the end comes, you know, it makes sense why it all happened. So I don't know. I don't think so. But maybe I'll, I'll let you know if I can think of something later. So even anime, you finished any anime you've started. Have you completely seen it to the end? I, well, I know well, Scott, yeah. you sometimes drop some seasons, don't you? Typically, our drops are pretty scarce. And the ones that we drop usually are just, they're kind of crap. Like, they're not really that good. I wouldn't say it has so much to do with like, oh, they killed the character off or they made one particular decision. Like, oh, this show was great. It was, it was, you know, it was pumping. And then all of a sudden they, they, they turn this character evil or whatever. And mm-hmm. now I don't like it. It's usually something else like, oh, the show was never good. And now I just can't stand it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, your time is coming, Millennial Mike. There'll be a time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> be. It'll happen. 